Hello everyone and welcome to the second video of my series on heteroscedasticity. Here we'll deal with solutions to the problem of heteroscedasticity. I'll present three approaches and discuss why they often work. At the end I'll also speak about what in modern econometric practice is the approach we usually take and why, spoiler alert, uh, we just use heteroscedasticity robust standard errors. In uh, one or two weeks time I will also upload the showcases, the methods with some simulated data. If the video is up already, uh, you could also put it into a second tab in your browser and watch the empirical application right after the intuition that I put here. First up is the functional form. Uh, functional form is a very simple remedy that you can use. If you're lucky, you could transform the heteroscedasticity back into homoscedastic errors and you no longer have any issues. I'll give you two examples of the most prominent cases for this here. So, first of all, the log transformation. Uh, this is especially handy when your data have a fat tail. Uh, the most common example for that that I know is uh, income data. So, the median household income in the US was around 71,000 US dollars in 2021, but there is still a very good amount of households who earn in excess of 200,000, 700,000, or even a million US dollars. Uh, so that means that our income distribution has a fat tail to its right. Now, you can remove that problem with logs. On the left, I have raw incomes that I simulated. On the right is the same distribution, but with logs. It looks much nicer. Okay, now let's see that this transformation also removes our heteroscedasticity. Here I plotted simulated data of years of schooling versus income. The left hand side shows pretty clear heteroscedasticity. As years of schooling increases, the error variance also increases. The right hand side, on the other hand, looks much better. Um, as a Short aside, what I did here was to transform the dependent variable. You can also transform an independent variable, i.e. those that are on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Another common approach is to include some polynomial terms. For example, the squared value of a variable on the right-hand side. Let's look at another example of the effect of years of schooling on income. On the left hand side, I estimated a normal linear regression that includes years of schooling only linearly. The graph isn't too bad, but you can see that heteroscedasticity might be an issue here. The graph on the right hand side, I also included years of schooling squared. The fit here looks much better. You can also look at the residuals. On the left, we can see that at some years of schooling, the residuals have much lower variance than at others. That supports our observation that there might be at risk of toxicity. The graph, left graph, looks much better in that respect. Right, so one way to get rid of heteroscedasticity uh, is to change your functional form. Usually you should think about your functional form before running your regression though. Uh, think hard about what makes sense, what would probably describe the data well, how would you stabilize the data, and so on. Instead of trying to remove the heteroscedasticity, uh, you could also try to live with it. Uh, so we know that we still get a consistent estimate for beta, it's half an hour regression. Uh, if you don't remember that, check out the first video of my series on it. Earlier, I gave you the formula for the variance of beta hat under heteroscedasticity. Uh, you can also check it here again. Um, we know the xi's, so we can simply plug those in. As our estimate of beta is consistent, we can also construct these error terms here. So, now we actually have the correct standard errors. Um, so, this is um, the normal uh, formula, but you can also write this out um, in this way. Um, this is the formula in matrix notation. Uh, if you haven't encountered matrix notation, uh, don't worry, um, just bear with me. I won't go too deep in. 
Now, the main question is how do we estimate uh, the big middle bit in this formula? Small fun fact, um, this whole formula is usually called a sandwich form in econometrics. Um, you've got these two terms by the side. Uh, those are the bread. And the thing inside is the meat um, or your favorite topping. Um, yummy, isn't it? As I said, there have been quite a few proposals um, to estimate this little bit. Um, the one that performs best, according to simulations, is known as HC3, uh, heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors of type 3. Um, if you use data and only specify robust, it doesn't give you HC3 standard errors, but the HC1 standard errors, which are inferior. So you should ideally always make sure that you specify HC3 standard errors when you use Stata. If you use R, you're both more and less lucky. Um, the standard LM function to fit an OLS regression in R doesn't actually compute robust standard errors at all. Um, however, if you use the sandwich package, it does give you HC3 standard errors by default. So you, then you don't have to worry anymore about which standard errors to use. You're already using the best one. Um, two small notes on this. Um, firstly, if you have autocorrelation in the error term, you need yet other standard errors. This series of videos, these with heteroscedasticity, I assume there's no autocorrelation. Um, for example, depending on what type of autocorrelation you have, uh, you might want to use HACE standard errors that we often find for time series. That's heteroscedasticity at auto correlation consistent standard errors. Um, or you might want to use uh, clustered standard errors if you have panel data. Um, secondly, there's another method that's sometimes taught in postgrad courses, uh, which is the bootstrap. For regressions, you usually use the wild bootstrap to accommodate heteroscedasticity. I also won't go into too much detail here. Uh, just remember that the bootstrap is another method that lives with heteroscedasticity. Right, the first solution was to try some ad hoc data transformations that fully give you a model with heteroscedastic errors. The second solution was to just live with heteroscedasticity and forego the potential efficiency gains. The third solution is generalized least squares, and this is a systematic method to make the errors in your model homoscedastic. Um, so that's the technical intuition of what happens. You transform the model such that mathematically your errors are homoscedastic. Um, I didn't find this intuition too helpful, so maybe you'll be happier with what I came up with. Also, just as an aside, generalized least squares itself is a very deep topic, so I won't go into detail in this series. If there's interest, let me know. I might put up a video on generalized least squares itself. So I want to lead you through weighted least squares, which is one way that we implement GLS in practice. Let's look at some graphical intuition again. Now, let's consider two possible sets of observations. They are both generated by the same intercepted slope, but their error variances differ. If I asked you to pick one set of, of one set of observations that you want to use to estimate your regression as precisely as possible, which one would you pick? For me, it would be easy. Um, I'd pick the set of observations on the left. The points are much tighter than on the right. So personally, I feel much more confident about what I got. Okay, now imagine that we have both sets of points together. More data is always great, so we probably want to do this. But now we treat each data point the same, even though the ones on the left seem to describe the line much better than those on the right. Therefore, we might want to give those observations that describe the line much better, a higher weight when estimating the regression, to make use of the fact exactly that they describe the line much better. And this is the intuition behind weighted least squares. Uh, we weight each observation by how close it is to our fitted line, 
So we focus on the points that are closer to our imagined line. It turns out that the best way to do this for OLS linear regression is to wait by the inverse of the error variance at that point. Personally, I think this is a much neater intuition for what happens behind the scenes for weighted least squares. Uh, there's a small word of caution here too. What if there isn't a straight line in the data, but some other kind of curve? Just like we saw above, for example, if the true relationship between X and Y is quadratic, um, but you only fit the line. So that's called model misspecification. I'll give a nice example in the next video, um, but in case of misspecification, it's actually much harder to interpret what generalized least squares or what the special case weighted least squares actually estimates. All right, I hope you now have a good understanding of the different methods that we use to deal with heteroscedasticity when it arises and why those methods work. But which of the methods do econometricians nowadays use? In empirical practice, you almost always use robust standard errors, plain and simple. Of course, you think carefully about which variables you include in which form in your regression equation, but you don't modify your equation ad hoc simply because you have heteroscedastic error terms. GLS estimators, including weighted least squares, also have fallen out of fashion for a couple of reasons. So, firstly, they often perform poor when you don't have much data. Um, but unfortunately, that's exactly the situation when we really want to have those efficiency gains. So, in those situations when we would want to use GLS, it isn't very useful. The second problem with GLS is that of misspecification. If you don't actually have a straight line in the data, the output of GLS is um, much harder to interpret. But I think most data don't exhibit nice straight line. So what remains? A robust standard errors. Since our data sets nowadays are often much bigger than they used to be in the past, we don't go for those extra gains in efficiency that might come from other solutions. So, in your thesis or wherever you use econometrics, you will want to use robust and ideally HC3 robust standard errors. All right, we've come quite a way. What are the key takeaways? Uh, firstly, always use robust standard errors. Secondly, Think carefully about the function of form that you use, whether to include variables and logs or levels, whether to include square or maybe even cubic terms, and so on. Uh, like my previous series on propensity score, I thought it would be neat to show the effects of these different methods in practice. Uh, therefore, the next video again shows some empirical applications to illustrate the ideas. I'd also very much appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to my channel to stay up to date when future videos come out.